I'm Annabelle Candy from Get In The Hot Spot. We talk about advanced adventures for body and soul, which is really about helping people in the second half of their lives make sure their lives are filled with fun and adventure. This week, I'm going to be talking to Philip Shepherd. He's the author of New World, New Self, which I've got um, here on my iPad to show you. The iPad's turned itself off now, though. And the reason that I wanted to get in touch with Philip and had to speak to him was after reading this article about him in The Sun magazine. If you can read that, the, the headline is Out of Our Heads. Philip Shepherd on the brain in our belly, it said. Well, I read that article and I was just fascinated because I'd never heard of the brain in the belly before and I wanted to find out more. So here I am with Philip Shepherd. Hi, Philip. Hey Annabelle, hey Annabelle, how are you? Good, thank you. Thank you so much for agreeing to join me today for this interview. I'm really excited to be talking to you. It's it's kind of fun to be here. I've never done the uh, the uh, Google Plus online YouTube interview, so it's a new one for me. Oh, for me too, Philip. I probably shouldn't tell you that, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, in fact, the, um, the, my belly and my brain has been a little bit nervous about it, but I think it's okay with it now. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, Philip, would you like to, to explain to people who have no idea what I'm talking about what the belly in the brain is? I know there are a few different names for it. The second brain, the enteric brain, the gut brain, the brain in the belly. What do you call it, and how would you explain what it is to people? I actually think of it as the first brain, um, even though it's called the second brain, because in terms of our evolution, it existed as a brain before we developed the cranial brain. And the brain, it, it's a very funny thing, because we've known over a hundred years that Every mammal, including us, is born with a second brain in the belly. And when I say a second brain, I don't mean a secondary brain, because it's a, it's a complete autonomous brain unto itself that thinks, remembers, decides, um, perceives, acts without any help needed from the brain in the head. Its primary function is digestion, but then the curious thing is that center in the belly has been considered a, a thinking center in many, many cultures, including our own. If you go back far enough into our own history, the, um, the earliest uh, reconstructed language we have is called Indo-European. And the roots of that language show us that the navel was considered the center of the self. And that shows up in early Neolithic art as well. So we've devoted ourselves to the head in our culture, in our habits, in our architecture, in our iconography, to such an extent that when the brain in the belly was discovered, People, I guess they said, oh, that's interesting, but there's no room in our understanding of what it means to be human for a brain in the belly. And so we forgot it, and uh, it was rediscovered by Johannes Langley, and it was forgotten again. It was rediscovered by Michael Gershon in the 1960s, and it took him 15 years of presenting methodical research to answer objections made by his fellow neuroscientists before they finally said, all right, you're right. By any standard we wish to define a brain by, that entity in the belly is an independent brain. So it was sanctified in the 1980s by neuroscience, but still, you go to someone on the street and say, how many brains do you have? They'll look at you as though you're somewhat <laughs> lunatic. It's funny. <laughs> I can imagine. So I've, I've just turned my iPad on again. So the, the subheading of your book there, New Self, New World, is recovering our senses in the 21st century. 
And I guess I forgot to tell you, I said I'd tell you at the beginning why I was so particularly interested in your book. And the reason for that is I've been suffering from depression this year. And it's not the first time I've had depression. I had depression about 10 years ago. So as part of the work I've been doing, I'm trying to get more in touch with my emotions and spend more time being and less time doing. And it's actually really hard to get in touch with your emotions. And I know that getting in touch with the enteric brain is one way to do that. So that's why I was particularly interested in your book and in finding out more about it, especially because, you know, I think I, I'm not alone. Obviously, you feel the same as me. And I'm sure there are lots of other people who find with all the technology available to us now, we're spending less time outside, we're spending less time in nature. We're just not in touch with the real world we're not in touch with ourselves and that's a real problem yeah i'm uh, i'm i'm blessed i've never i've never suffered depression well i did i did as a 10 year old but that's a long time ago um <laughs> but uh, but my sense and what i remember is this increasing sense of of sort of isolation from the world and this withdrawn um sense of disconnection just I don't know if that accords with the way you feel and mm. and and that's that's so much what our culture teaches us um, is to disconnect is to live in that in but just by just by living in the head you are withdrawing from the sensations of the body that's what living in the head does it's sort of quiets the body or disconnects from it and then you're left with your own thoughts that go round and round in your head and the the body is your bridge to the world and so it's it's a it's like withdrawing into your private isolation chamber um, and an isolation chamber you know if you look at research on isolation chambers um, they they corrode your sense of yourself that's sort of the inevitable outcome of, of an isolation chamber I don't know if that makes sense with your experience yeah yeah it absolutely does I think um, you know a lot of depression is about feeling disconnected and lonely not not fitting in in the world and I guess not it's about not knowing who you really are or not living the values that you hold dear to yourself so all yeah. those things are really true but it sounded in the interview and maybe in the book, you spent a lot of time as a young man traveling around the world looking for different options and different kind of lifestyles. And that took you to Japan, where you learned a lot of the information that you share in New World, New Self. Have you got anything to tell us about that? Yeah, I was, um, it's funny, as a teenager, <laughs> I was, um, I spent a lot of time in the emotion of rage and, and it, I didn't, I didn't act out in, in destructive ways, but I could feel my, my being violated by the strictures and mores and random values, um, that my culture was inculcating in me, and and I it was it was like I was being put to sleep or something by my culture, and and I anyway, <laughs> uh, so I did I, I realized at a certain point, however much I wished to um, transcend those influences of my culture, I I ultimately wasn't going to be able to do it. While I remained within my culture, and and so I knew about Japanese no theater, and really had been profoundly, profoundly moved by it. And so it didn't seem unreasonable to go to England and buy a bicycle and cycle through Europe and the Middle East and India and make my way to Japan. So the no theater, in a way, was the excuse and. The travel by bicycle was the means, and on a bike you're just exposed to the world, 
and you're not a threat. You know, you ride in on to a little village on a bicycle and you're kind of like one of them. It's not like arriving in a in a big fancy car. And so I passed through so many different ways of understanding what it means to be human. And 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 these these are expressed in architecture and customs and dress and and iconography and and each one of them was valid and uh, luminous and limited but I didn't actually suffer culture shock until I returned home mm. and I'd grown up it was the home I'd grown up in and the city I'd grown up in and everything was rendered it's so familiar and at the same time so bizarre and arbitrary and and what had happened was I I was in a position on my return where I was now capable of asking the questions that I'd been incapable of formulating before I left and those questions are, are what led to the book. Mm. So the book's quite new, though. Is it just published last year? or? Well, it was published yeah. in uh, 2010, okay. August of 2010. Okay, so it's been quite a lifelong journey for you. What led you to, to you know, I'll say finally, because you, you have been studying this your whole life, really, by the sounds of it. What led yeah. you to finally write and publish this book and what are the main messages you want to get across? I didn't ever decide to write the book. The way it happened, we were on vacation, um, which was a weird thing for me because I didn't go on vacation, but we had kids and it was a, a nice thing to do. And I sort of decompressed for a couple of days and then literally at five o'clock in the morning, in the blink of an eye, I was as wide awake as I've ever been in my life with the first line of this book in my head. And I was utterly electrified by it. And I just lay there in the dark by 6 o'clock in the morning. I sort of had the first chapter roughed out. By 7 o'clock, I had a sense of the next two chapters. So there we were on vacation, and I started writing. And so... You know, the family would go off to see the sights, and I'd be back writing, kind of obsessed with this this thing that had me by the jugular and wouldn't let go. And, and people have said, oh, my goodness, it took you nine or ten years to write the book. That's so wonderful, oh, wonderful. that you kept going. And oh, the reality yeah. is, no, no, it just hurt it too, hurt much, too much, much not to be writing it. And I wrote it. I wrote it four times, uh, and each each time I wrote it, it's like I'm trying to get across to the other side of this river, and each draft was like a big boulder, and I, you know, I could reach out and put it as far as I could into the river, and and then at least I had that to stand on to hoist the next boulder, and each draft of the book was like that, getting me just a little bit closer, a little bit closer until I arrived at the other side. What a fantastic story. I'm so glad you <laughs> you went through all that and carried on with it. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, so the main messages, I mean, what, you know, what would you like to tell people who are maybe still watching this and still thinking, enteric brain? What? In order to understand the enteric brain, It helps to understand the extent to which our culture instructs us to live in the head. So cars aren't just means of transportation, they're heads on wheels. And they've got two headlights because even though three or four would illuminate the road better, the metaphor insists on two because they're the eyes. And this skull we sit on we sit within, we're comfortable because we live in our heads in the same way. Um, that shows up in our architecture, our language, our hierarchies. I mean, any any hierarchy is ruled by the head. 
of that hierarchy, whether it's a chief executive officer, and chief is a Latin word that means head, whether it's a captain, captain is a Latin word that means head, all of the, you know, the all of the heads of state, the heads of the church, the, the heads of our social institutions, by calling them heads, we are learning that the head should rule. So you begin to understand this matrix within which we live that, that insists that we live in the heads and rule ourselves with the head. And then, alternatively, you look at other cultures that have a very different experience. The Japanese, where I went to study no theater, their culture rests on a, a foundation that recognizes hara, which is the Japanese word for belly. Hara is the foundation of your truth. It's, it's, it, you return to the belly to return to yourself. And they have a host of phrases in which they use hara where we use head, you know, we'll say, he's hot-headed. They say, his belly rises easily. We say, oh, he's got a good head on his shoulders. And we say, he's, uh, he, the Japanese would say, he's got a well-developed belly. So there's a, there's a difference between the brain and the cranium and the brain and the belly. The brain and the cranium is where you can consciously think. The brain and the belly is where you can consciously be. Okay. And our culture doesn't make room for being. It's like we build these places where it's impossible to be. You, you cannot just be on a road, for example. You'll get run over if you're a pedestrian, if you just stand on the road as a way of being. If you're in a car and traffic is thick and you're stopped, well, there's an invitation to just be, but we can't. We're chomping at the bit to get moving. Anyone who, the only people who can uh, be on a sidewalk and just be are the homeless. We, we have, we, the, so we have no um, invitation within our culture to just be. And so we give and give and give without learning how to receive. There is no time in, in the typical day where you are invited to just receive. And it's through that receptivity that the world nourishes us, and, and it's through that nourishment that we discover our kinship with all that is. And that, that ability to just be happens when you actually drop down through the body and come to rest deep within the belly, on the, on the pelvic floor. And suddenly everything changes. You, you discover that the way you inhabit your body entirely determines how you feel and experience the world around you. That's, that's amazing. I, I, I love in the book how you explain all these cultural reasons. I think they're so interesting about why we are very much stuck in the head and why we worship the brain and have just ignored this whole brain in the belly. Um, maybe you could explain, you know, you, you've touched on the, the advantages there of getting in touch with the brain in your belly and not just ignoring it, the kind of kinship that you feel with other people and the world in general. I told you that I'm interested in it to try and become more aware of my emotions and I suppose the point of that is that once you're aware of your emotions then you can start um, or stop reacting to them so extravagantly. Uh, are there any other advantages of people for really getting in touch with this belly in their brain, brain in the belly? There are lots. There are lots. Um, Good. <laughs> When you're in your head, you truly feel isolated from the world. Mm -hmm. And then you tend to take everything personally. Um, everything is self-centered, and you live in a way that is consistently self-conscious. Because you're isolated, you become conscious of the self 
in a whole different way. It's you don't. There is no unity with the world, and so you feel the self in isolation from it. And self consciousness is really one of the most miserable states to live in. Um, it's a state where you continually judge yourself, and you're a spectator on your own emotions and and on your own actions, and and you're you're all the time. Um, busy trying to get it right and you know it's it's like a choice you can either spend your time trying to get it right or you can spend your time being alive to what is and that capacity of being alive to what is 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 what happens when you drop down into the belly and begin to live from from your wholeness and really my work more than anything is about is about acknowledging our wholeness and getting in touch with our wholeness and our wholeness you know our our cultural sense of the self um, teaches us that your wholeness is something uh, kind of that you achieve within the skin but there is no self independent of the world. So your, your being is what you discover when you're fully present. And that is, that is your wholeness, that connection, that ability to rest in the present moment. And one of the things that keeps us from that is our addiction to knowledge. Um, we... I've got you know, that. <laughs> there, everyone does. Check the email, check the this, check the that. Our, our addiction to knowledge is like, um, it's like a completely neglected aspect of our culture. And it's, it's invidious because the idea, what we're, what we're taught, what our culture proposes, is that knowledge will save you. Now, on a grand scale, if knowledge could save us as a species, we'd be in much better shape now than we were 200 years ago. Knowledge will never save us. Um, the more knowledge we acquire, the more dangerous it becomes because we're not, we're not developing our self-knowledge to balance out our knowledge. And we're so far from developing our self-knowledge that we imagine self-knowledge and knowledge to be sort of the same thing. Self-knowledge is sort of a, a kind of knowledge. And they're opposites. So, so knowledge, you know, is, is facts and, and, and information. And, and you can write a book that, that tallies knowledge and... and it's all these little bits of information that you can accumulate. We think of self-knowledge in the same way. Well, you know, I, this is my age, and these are my values and my beliefs, and this is my favorite color. And it's like compiling a grocery list of who you are. In fact, who you are isn't a stable entity, because who you are is revealed to you by the present and the present is always an unknown mm. so there's that aspect of self-knowledge that is just willing to embrace that unknown quality of the present and discover yourself therein so, so self-knowledge self -knowledge. is carried to us by the world it's carried to us by each of our relationships you know if I if I pick up a glass of water and truly receive it it becomes a little revelation through the kinship of which I'm awakening something in myself and so you the self is awakened through its relationships with the world so knowledge is is sort of a a self, sort of a, a self centered understanding of the world. Of the world. And, I it's self -centered and I say it's self centered because, because 
you know, knowledge is something we possess. Is something we it's possess. something we hoard. It's something, something we gather and, something we and gather cling to. Cling to. Um, um, so it's got that, so that self-centered self quality, quality to it. Self-knowledge self -knowledge is a world-centered world understanding, understanding of the self. Of the self. It's a gift, it's a gift that, is that is born by the world, by the world around, around you. you. Mm. So, so that's a, I mean, that's a huge advantage. I think you know the, the things you talked about about how living in the head leads to feelings of isolation and self-consciousness and self-centered, and all those kind of things are making people feel more and more isolated and depressed, even though they. They're actually more connected through, you know, all these amazing technologies that are available to us. So this huge, there's a huge advantage there of self-knowledge. I think what's interesting is what you touched on, how most people think they know themselves because they know what their favorite color is and they know how old they are, but actually they don't really. So, you know, they might not even realize that this is something they need to find out about because there's a whole aspect of themselves that they haven't explored. And and, and they, they, that, exploration that exploration is something that they're something not encouraged to do because they're encouraged, they're encouraged to think of, think of um, um, managing the managing self, the being in self, control, control of the self, of the self uh, mastering, you know, self-mastery. Self -mastery. And pe people forget that, well, let me see well, now. Now, if you're mastering, if you're the, mastering self, the self, doesn't that mean doesn't you're, putting you're, you're putting the self into the bondage? Self bondage? You can't have it any other way. If you're mastering the self, then the self is, is a slave that's been mastered. And then what does that Doesn't sound like freedom, right? But we, we don't allow ourselves to feel what is because we know what we should be feeling about everything around us. We, we don't allow ourselves to be wholly present to another person, to the city street we're walking down, partly because it's easier to manage yourself and let let that bit of numbness seep in than it is to feel and feel deeply. But it's from that place of feeling and feeling deeply that your whole life cracks open and your your purpose is not just revealed, but you become capable of living it. Well, fantastic quote right there. Oh, I love the sound of that. So what I've been doing to try to get in touch with my emotions and feelings and live more wholly, I suppose, um, is a lot of mindfulness and meditation. This was before I, I read your book, and I'm still carrying on doing my mindfulness and meditation. And I'm now loving your book because there's practical exercises in there that I can do, some of them by myself and some of them um, with my family. So that's fun. Can you tell me a little bit about what you do in your life to try and maintain this wholeness? Because I suppose, it's, you know, it's an ongoing thing. Oh, it's an ongoing thing. Absolutely. <laughs> um, there, are, there are practices that I put in my book that are just a part of my daily life. Um, okay. So we, how, how often would you do some of those exercises? I just did one right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, what, there's what, one we called, wrong video. Yeah. So, well, <laughs> just as you were asking your question. So, so there's an exercise called the elevator shaft. I don't know if you've um, encountered it. Okay. Yes, I did that one while I was out for a walk in the woods the other day. I stopped in a beautiful clearing, and yeah. Yeah. So the elevator shaft, peculiarly, um, something. I don't know why our culture doesn't recognize it, but we don't. There was a, a migration of our thinking self from deep, deep in the belly as we, as we withdrew from a mother-centered culture and turned towards a patriarchal culture. The center of our thinking actually moved up 
through the body and lodged itself finally in the head. And the elevator exercise reverses that and allows the center of your thinking to just drop down through the body. I, I talk about it dropping down like a pearl through a jar of olive oil, just smoothly and continuously until it finally lands, comes to rest on the pelvic floor. Deep, deep. I call it the ground of your being. Yeah. That, that right. It's where it's where you can truly, truly come to rest. Um, and if I'm feeling bad or, or not that great, it's a sign of several things. And it's like, in a way, my work is about um, the fact that. You know, when you're driving in your car, you've got the speedometer and the odometer and the fuel gauge and the, all these instruments to, to tell you how well you're doing. Well, those have gone dark in our culture with regards to the body. And so part of my work is illuminating again our senses that tell us, okay, how much space are you experiencing in the body? And our bodies become congested. And when they're congested, there is no room for the world. And then, of course, we're closed upon ourselves. So there's an exercise in the book called The Hourglass. I don't know if you've encountered it, where you learn what it is to just empty the body and make room for all the world around you. And spaciousness in the body feels good. It's what you discover walking in the woods, you know, uh, walking by the seaside, you, things drop away and suddenly there's all this space in the body. That's, that's something once you become aware of it that you can just check in with yourself and, oh my gosh, look at all that congestion and you can release it and process it and integrate it and come back to that sense of ease of, of being whole in your body in the present moment. So you'll you'll do a few of these exercises every day and you know as many as needed I suppose. I'm at the point where I I don't I don't so much so set much time, time aside, aside to do it as the you know the the fuel gauge is, is visible and when you need gas you stop and you fill up when I'm so my gauges say hold on we're getting a little confused here. And I just go back to a place of receptivity, which to me means coming down to that place on the pelvic floor and just coming to rest in the moment. Mm. And then the whole world changes. Yeah, amazing. Do you still yeah. run workshops as well on this? Yeah, last weekend I had one in Orlando. Oh, okay. um, I, and I've got a slew of them that are being scheduled for the fall. I I love teaching the workshops because I'd love to come. So how can yeah. people find out about those workshops, Philip? I I there are two ways. One is I I have a newsletter yeah. um, that I only put out when necessary. So it's not that I flood um, mailboxes with it, but it always talks about what's coming up. Yes. So you could sign up for my newsletter on the website, and each newsletter has a little, um, a little reflection, a little um, story about something that I think people might find interesting, might help them. And uh, the other thing is on my website. When a workshop's been slated, I always post it on the website. Okay, fantastic. Well, yeah. uh, if you ever come to Australia. I'm to keen come. to do that. I've got a bit of a following in Australia, so... Oh, that's fantastic. I did yeah. actually think, well, I should go to Toronto to do one of these workshops. They're so good, but obviously, oh, you know... Please if you do. Came to Australia, that'd be ideal. <laughs> I'd love to. I'd absolutely love to. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, look, I know the exercises in the book are, are, are fantastic, a really good way to start. I'm just going to show people the book again and hopefully they'll check it out on Amazon. 
New Self, New World by Philip Shepard. So I'm going to end the conversation here, Philip, because I know we've had a really good chat and I know people are busy. Probably the best thing for them to do is really read your book now and start doing some of the exercises, but hopefully we've got them interested in it. Yeah, and they could also, just to mention this on my website, there's an interview I did, the one with the Sun magazine, that's mm -hmm. posted in full. So if if they'd like to find out more about my work, that's a kind of easy, gentle way to, to get a big picture of it. Definitely. Well, I'll link to your website and to that interview in the Sun and the book is on Amazon as well from the blog post that I'll write. And hopefully I'll be able to embed the video in that as well. And, Wonderful. Uh, yeah. Can't wait to share it. Absolutely. It's been uh, such a joy, Annabelle. Thank yeah, you so, so yeah. much. Great to speak to you. So I'm Annabelle Candy from Get In The Hot Spot, and I've been speaking to Philip Shepherd from philipshepherd.com. Thank you all for listening. Bye-bye. Bye, Philip. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>